1924 date and start of the tour of the Cotswolds, visiting the dancers that they knew of, and so on. They, how it was done is that Arthur Peck had a car and carried a kit, and all the others went in by bicycle, and either slept in barns or something like that, and so on. Now that was not uncommon for the traditional Cotswolds to go off for a week's tour, just to walk around and get under hedges or in barns, and so on, and take a supply of clean shirts with them, and so on. Um, that occurred in a number of places. So the next phase after the war was the EFTSS, or English Fantastic Science Society, that didn't join up to the 1930s, um, started classes. They saw their role as still is, to give the dancers back to the people. And the sort of best way of doing that, the only way they knew, was to run classes. Now, the branch in Oxford, again, I talked to the original secretary of that branch at some length one day, um, about what it was like. Um, and it was a bit weird. Um, Henry Frank of Filtain came around and complained about the standard of Morris dancing. And he came around at some point time, they got fed up with him. So they arranged him to come around to Christchurch one night and do his dances so they can get him. <coughs> so he came around and did it jig for the last day of his order. And so on, you know, they just ignored they did. Mr. Sharp had it right and he didn't know, you know despite the fact he was the source and so on. Um, and I say this secretary um, was quite irritated by these traditional dances. Similarly, uh, it comes up when they were Sharp was organising a show. Um, the two Franklin brothers came over to say, you know, we don't like what you're doing and so on. And they clambered into the arena to act determined to show off how it ought to be done. And uh, they were hushed up and got, got out of the way and so on. You've got to remember there's that element running through it. So <coughs> classes were run. There was a class at Ascot under which there was a class at Fieldtain. Then a class at Fieldtain, again I ran into. When you and Russell and I, I took them on a tour to meet old dancers in 1963. Um, Margaret and I had a holiday in Bampton a week or so before. And I took you to the Fox at Fieldtain. Uh, because the man who ran the shop next door, we knew we'd been in the local um, boys team. And he told his stories about the woman coming from Oxford, teaching them, uh, the old dancers coming around, looking at them, steering, and saying, that's not Morris at all. They were doing anything, and so on. And then the following evening, they got, he got together a bunch of his friends, and they sat with one of them at the piano, and six of them got up, and they started to do the Morris. And you and I didn't recognise what they were doing. We thought, God no, they, what's this? You know, late field 10 or whatever, and then, then their last dance they did was bean setting. And we realised that what they were doing is what they could remember of Eddington, um, with a gap of perhaps 50 or 60 years where they've been doing it amongst themselves for amusement. That's hard. Um, but then that taught me another thing, that just because he's old and did do a Morris one, he don't necessarily do what he used to do. He does what he can, and so on. Um, and we have to remember that when we're looking at old records. In fact, very often these were old men dancing. Um, the good sample of that is that there's a video of um, George Butterworth and Lord Carpley doing Duke Bampton and so on, um, and they do it in these lovely broad ways. Remember, they are copying old men. They're not actually copying the young men of the time. Right. So there we are. Um, the classes run very well. There are competitions between the sides, but you had to go through various grades if you were in the competition. Um, I had picked up some good stories though. Um, at Sherbourne, where they had a British club, I talked to several of the couples who went along to it and said, well, what did you do? You know, practice and I said, well, we don't remember because it was all, it was all about boy meets girl, about quarter nights for, the, for these things, you know. Um, we went along for the fun, not actually to learn much and so on. Uh, when I talked to the um, women at Minstead in the New Forest, who had a, there's a, at Minstead there's a whole 
with a painting of Morris Tapsis on the wall inside. And so on, you thought, well, that must have been strong. So I talked to them, and I talked to them on two occasions where they all did, they talked to me about the competitions and going to devices for the corn fair and that sort of thing, yeah, competition. And then I finally got exasperated and said, look, there must have been a men's team. Yes, they said, these two men, but we don't like to talk about them. Why not? He said, well, on Friday night, they were dressed up in the Morris costume, go down to the local pub looking for a bench up. They didn't go down to Morris, they went down to stir it all up and have a fight. <laughs> and they began to realise, yeah, that was quite common in the country districts um, before and after the First World War. The world was somewhat different. I know that one of Marguerite's family friends was a, a sergeant of the police who remembered my father from being a boy and so on, you know, who um, village discipline, you know, taking somebody up a side street to have a few words with them and things of that sort dealing with people there. Somebody who got drunk and fighting at the weekend um, had a quiet word with them that usually cured them of fighting, sort of thing and so on. It's just a different attitude to the world to what we have now, 100 years later, 200, no, 80 years later, and so on. Um, so, 1934, <coughs> um, thanks that it was going each year, um, but that although it had been started by a Mary Neal supporter, um, had become dancing on the vicarage lawn with Morris dancing as part of the show. It was not a separate Morris event in its early days. Uh, um, there were a number of events of that sort that closely involved the English folk dance and song revival and so on. In 1934, there were six men's sides available um, of which the Cambridge Morris men and the Travelling Morris part of it were the key part. Um, Rolf Gardner um, had formed a strong relationship with the North Scout and Dancers and had got a sword team in the Morris side going um, down in Dorset. Now, I've mentioned Rolf before. His uncle was Balfour Gardner, the composer, and Balfour Gardner bought him a farm, Gore Farm on the ridge below um, Gillingham, North Dorset, Ooh, not Gillingham, something like Gillingham. I can't remember. So, um, anyway, it's, it's just a, a whole part of <coughs> Northern Dorset had been deserted. The farming couldn't make sense, so people weren't there. So they bought a farm and decided to run it on um, eco good ecological terms. In other words, if you could make it a wood, you grew the wood. You know, um, and things of that sort. Self-sufficiency he aimed for. Um, he also believed in back to the land is good for everybody. So he formed um, the Springhead Ring. Now if you wonder why the Morris Ring is called the Ring, because Rolf Gard had already invented the idea of a, a circle of things. Um, in New Zealand, <coughs> They couldn't call themselves, didn't want to call themselves, they called themselves the spear. You know, because when you look at the world the right way up, New Zealand's at the top and we're down at the bottom. You, know, you need to go to New Zealand to see that. Um, still, um, Rob Gardner, um, self sufficiency he went for, and so on, um, as well as reviving uh, things like that. Now, he had a reputation of being a neo fascist. I don't know why. Obviously not by somebody who's actually taught him. I visited him a number of times because through him I got access to the logs of the early Travelling Morris tours, which he'd gone on. Um, so we got information about dances and what they did and things of that sort. Um, oh, at that time he was, his family were running, were farming in Rhodesia. Um, ethically farming and was a decent wage decent jobs for people and so on, um, kicked out by Mugabe, of course, and so on, you know, um, the big fail and so on. But at this back to the land, the professional people in London were invited down for the harvest, sometimes for the sowing, but basically for the harvest. So there would, there'd be doctors, musicians and things like that. I went to one event, um, they'd been harvesting 
and for relaxation, the people who done it did a performance of Aida on the lawn at the back of the mill. Um, when I say a performance of it, you either were performing, either you're an orchestra player or you're an actor. Um, and if your, your part came up, somebody else played your instrument while they were doing it. And then the gods came down on a trolley on this um, wire across the mill pond and so on. In many ways, as an outsider, I thought it was hilariously funny, but they had a wonderful time because they were mixing what they wanted to do, which is uh, living with the land at that time, with in fact doing the sort of relaxation they thought of as relaxation and so on. Um, it was, a, to my mind, a great man. During the war, oh, sorry, um, he tried running a link with people in northern Germany. Uh, after the war, so he thought the only way to resolve the problem of the First World War was to get the people to talk to each other. So he formed links between his own organisations and other English organisations, and the young people and adult organisations that were formed in the 20s and early 30s. Unfortunately, when Hitler arrived, all the youth organisations in Germany were all swallowed up into Hitler Youth. So um, all his links got severed. And so on. It hurt him very much that um, all these things have been cut off. Um, during the war, he became the um, coordinator for flax production. Now, flax was needed for ropes, needed for parachutes before nylon and bending, things like that. A rather key job. So much for him being a neo fascist. You know, he had a very key job during the war, and so on. Um, he had a run a magazine, North Sea and Baltic, um, linking things there. I think he had um, family roots in Finland as well, which encouraged him to do that. So um, He did a great deal. He got laughed at a lot. He, in 1923, wrote an article to the press saying that what's wrong with the folk world is in fact we should be presenting the best of folk material to the world at large. We should be having festivals where the best traditional performers, dancers and singers should be up. The only problem was he was 50 years ahead of his time. It all happened after the war, rather than after the Second World War than after the First World War. But I to say, I personally owe a great deal for his influence and so on. He was such a kind and helpful man. And so, I suppose, with many of those people I went to talk to, um, Ken Willie Schofield, um, at St Albans, was a great man for uh, picking up tunes for people. Sing it to him once and he got it. You know, um, dance something rather than he remembered it. But sympathy with the people he was talking to, no. He admitted he couldn't understand the people he was talking to and the way of life. Um, if I say when I talk to uh, Bobby Wells, that Jinky Wells' son, and his brother-in-law, Ted Hunt, I went to their cottage once. Um, and talk to their wives as well, but life was like a course of war. And basically, all the cooking was a, a cauldron over an open fire. And uh, if you cook something, you put it in a net bag and cooked it in the water in it. And over the week, it just got thicker and thicker until it became a stew or soup. They drank that and started again, and so on. Um, water, village pump, ape sign, and things like that. Now we're talking about 1912. You know, in the lifetime of my father, let alone my grandparents, <coughs> yeah, things were that bad. Um, you and Russ and I went to talk to Alec Wixey, Alec Dixie, at Bampton, who danced with Bampton uh, before the First World War. And when Mary Neal came up to choose some people to go up to London, he was very proud. He was the first, the best dancer, the first to be picked to go and teach the Bampton dancers in London. And so on. We met him in the swamp. Um, now, he'd gone down to work in the South Wales coalfield for eight years, working double shifts to make money. And when he made enough money, he came back and bought all the houses down one of the streets in Bampton and spent the rest of his life living off the rents. You know, um, he was really the landlord for the swan in any home. Um, that explains why the, the landlady gave such an undue deference to him when he came and we were shown into the best parlour to talk to and so on. And what I do remember about that occasion 
Yes, sir. You it went round the back, past the stone water, went to the gents' toilet in the dark. And he came back with blood on his hands, and everybody in the bar laughed. He said, What are you laughing at? He said, Well, nobody goes that far around with this time of night. <laughs> That's fine. So, um, but uh, again, stories about what life was like and so on, you need to sort of understand the context in which the Morris was done and so on. And the fact that the people did it. Um, Dick Butler was the musician when he was uh, dancing, um, and he was a player who played for um, social dancing as well. Um, went to the uh, village fairs and things like that and played and so on. Um, unfortunately, when it came to the Morris Day, they started at eight o'clock, you know, we and they, they drank homemade wine in all the cottages before they got into Bampton, by which time the dancers were sober because they danced, and the musicians were drunk because they didn't. And the story is he went round the corner into the road lead up the eagle, caught the neck of his fiddle by a dame pipe, broke the fiddle up there, and he said, thank God, and walked home. And that was it, that's the end of it. And Jinky Wiles went home then to pick up his own handmade fiddle to carry on playing for the rest of the day. And then he got a better fiddle later on, so, which is how Jinky Wiles got there, because he was a clown. And as a clown, um, if I say he was an illegitimate daughter son of an illegitimate woman, yeah, so he was not thought of highly in the village, he didn't have a, a high reputation, as it were. he was the odd job man never had a regular job in his life as well. Uh, and he would go off to a celebration anywhere else to play, or he would dress up as a clown and go off and dance and play to himself when he did a jig. Yeah. It may, you all may know dancing flowers of Edinburgh while you played. And he did the bend, you know, knees bend, all that sort of thing, that's him. Um, he did that for miles around. He was famous for doing that. And so on. Um, but he had a row, he was playing for the old ones, and they had a row one year, 19, year of the general site, 1926, had a row with the people, and he said, I have nothing more to do with you, so he went off and formed another side, who got known as the Youngins, of course, so he had the old ones and the young ones. Yeah. Those who had been to Bampton's we realised they named three sides, yeah, so it's something that happens quite easy, easily. Um, the old and the young ones ran up to the, first, the Second World War. After the war, they agreed for the two sides to join together um, for a while. Um, but there was such a difference of opinion between um, Arnold and the Sherbold that um, come about late 60s, they formed up two sides again. Uh, um, when Arnold took his side up to Social Sharp, no, to the Albert Hall show, along with the Sherbrooke side, the two of them together. Come the Sunday, Arnold's side weren't prepared to dance, but Social Sharp players, they wanted to go off and see the sights. So Arnold said, if you don't dance for me, you know, you're in. So Arnold formed a third side, which is why there are three sides. You know, Being to the Hatton, that traditional side. Same thing happened at Abingdon, there are two ways of looking at it. Uh, Mr. He Hemmings and Morris is broken away from uh, the having the traditional dancers because um, the traditional dancers weren't actually doing what the Hemmings family wanted them to do. So the Hemmings family formed their own side. So, um, happened at Abbey, at uh, Adderbury, didn't it? Two sides? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I can remember one of the sides. White Thorn formed it. Um, uh, <laughs> <coughs> North side of London, I know, Highgate, some of the um, <coughs> hole. And um, they got on very well, but they couldn't agree on what they were doing, so they split to two. Then one of those sides split to two, half of them went up to Cheshire. The Cheshire side couldn't agree on what it really was. Um, um, a Morris for the people, or Morris for themselves. So they split to two, one of which then split itself yet again. Yeah, so then we have a side that splits up. There's six or seven different groups. Each one with its own purpose, each perfectly happy with what it was doing. Yeah, um, so if you have that sort of problem in your club, don't worry, it goes on all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so there we are. The Morris Ring was painted 
Um, a typical ring meeting before the war with maximum 36 people. Um, in 1936, the ring meeting was at Walgrave Hall, um, uh, where uh, Major Fire owned, um, and all 36 people. They spent the morning learning the dances, that Kimber and Jinky Wells were there teaching, and then they spent the afternoon going on tour. They got to Abingdon, uh, in there, and uh, Henry Hemming was, was there as a coal merchant um, and joined in the dancing. They discovered there was an Abingdon tradition, uh, so they went to see Tom Hemmings and got them going. They went over to Ainsham to discover the Ainsham people that were thinking of getting going, and both Abingdon and Ainsham danced for the coronation in '37, and they were encouraged by the Morris Ring to keep going. They were invited to various functions and things of that sort. So the Morris yes, did a lot of good in those days in encouraging it. After the war, but during the war, most Morris stopped. It didn't stop in Abingdon because they danced for uh, Wings from Victory. You know, they, they were raising money for charity um, during the war, but they didn't get going again until 1948. You know, few sides got going immediately after the war was over. It took a while, but it is where the social life to start going again. Um, but then sides started to accumulate. Now, the reason I, I believe in that is in 1944, we had the Education Act, which enabled more all, all the, you know, working people to go to grammar schools free, which it wasn't before. And I sat the first uh, 11 plus exam in 1944. And in the first year that went, January 45, when our grammar school came back to Southampton, I started school. And following me was a whole succession of people who um, came from the sort of background that appreciated the Morris and other traditional cuttings on. And there's no doubt that when my generation got to university, we started to see university sides forming. They did at Bristol and, and other colleges and so on. And we saw this great egg flowing of sides starting in the 60s, I would say. Um, we had a very good weekend with, with um, Nibs Matthews at Holes Age 63, where I suddenly discovered that Nibs didn't know a lot about the Morris that I did. Yeah, so I pushed into actually teaching dances. So the next year, I actually ran the Hall Three weekend. And we ran the Hall Three weekends each year into the 70s, until they decided to put the price up enormously for booking it. Whereas uh, at that, up to that time, we got it fairly cheaply because we decided the Morris weekend would be when the staff at the hostel were actually having a holiday. Yeah, we provided the cook, cooks and things that sort. Um, we kicked out of that, but then the Cardiff men liked it. So we went down to um, Boys Town at St. Austell. It's an awesome food. Down the other side of Barry Island, anyway. Now, those people who ever went there will remember we da danced in a gym that was unheated in January. Everybody wearing anoraks <coughs> and so on, you know. Um, <coughs> it really was painful. But Bain's beer would deliver beer on <laughs> sale at return, and we were the only people they know that delivered a lorry load on a Saturday morning and topped it up Sunday morning as well. <laughs> and so on. I um, used to go down to Barry, to, into Barry Island to the town to drink something else other than Barry, um, the local beer. Right. Um, right. It wasn't the best of beers, I might say. Right. Um, right. And out of that grew really the whole idea of the Morris Federation. Um, I suppose, again, like everything else, I had a finger in it. Um, one year at... Um, Sidmouth, I think 72, Griff Jones was asked to run the Beginner's Morris Workshop <coughs> and he refused to have any women in the, in the marquee. There was a certain amount of complaint about that. So um, Bill, the next year, um, said to Tubby and I, we would run a weekend called Serendipity where we did the sort of thing that we could have mixed or women doing and just see what could be done. So, yes, we did um, some border dances, we did some stave dances, we did garland dances. We, 
a mix of the things that the men weren't doing, weren't using, on the basis, you know, we didn't know what women's morris was, but they at least could use the thing that, including sand bed and silver, because that was a, basically the inside. Um, and certainly, women went away from that to form sides, or they already had in mind to form a side, and so on, because they started to debate them. 73, 74, which is why we're getting a 40 year anniversary date for science and so on. I know one of the earliest was um, England's Glory, um, Windsor, um, quite early on, because um, uh, these sides, when they turned up at Sydney in the later years, I cornered them for a session in the gardens to film what they did, thinking I could blackmail them sometime in the future for what they really used to look like. Um, and it's Windsor's 40th anniversary in November, and I'm going to impose on them what they look like when they dance in skirts. <laughs> <laughs> That's still when it started, and it flourished from there onwards. There was talk of forming a Morris Federation, people who didn't want to join the ring. I was then at that stage also the representative of the South West of England on the advisory council. Um, I didn't live in the South West, but I was the only sucker you know, available. Um, so I went along there and I was hearing all the arguments that were being made by the men's side about why women shouldn't do the most. Now it came as a surprise to me because it never had occurred to me that women were so stupid as want to do the most. You know, I thought it's the sort of thing that stupid men got on the dip, um, playing around, being fools themselves. Like, I thought some people were more sensible. I was wrong, of course. You know, um, we got involved, Bath City as much as anybody. Um, got to talk to Betty Reynolds, who was just the right person for the time. Um, had sympathy, had been teaching the girls at Bath University. Um, had her own opinions about what should be done. It was not easily swayed by other people. She listened, but they made up her own mind. And they did that, the Norris Federation. Now, all the advisory ring would do is say, what we would do, all the men's side will join, the ring side will join the Norris Federation and swarm with it. See, which is why it became the women's Norris Federation. Now, a blank door. Now, the poor old open Morris up in East Anglia had no idea about this argument going on. So all they could see is form their own organisation to do what they wanted, which is just as well because there are more than two ways of actually approaching the Morris. And I think we managed to live together, not only very, very well, but they cooperate together very well, and it isn't one man's opinion anymore. Now, one of the worst things in my life, professional life, is actually where you rely on one person's opinion. You know, on critical issues, you need multiple opinions, you know, listen to everybody, and then try and find the best balance for you all. And I think the way the Morris organisation is going at the moment is wonderful. It may not be the long-term solution, but it's the right thing for today. Right? My own philosophy, yes, I've been teaching Morris for 50 years, been doing it for 50 years. I've been in the influential position because I was able to copy the Sharp manuscripts and his field notebooks at a slack time in my career. And I have to say, slack time in my career were few and far between and so on, um, but I was able to do so, able to get that material out. I was the major contribution to Lionel Bacon's Black Book, which was ideal at the time, because it increased the repertoire from 80 dancers to 360 yeah. odd, and so on. <coughs> no one person could really learn to do it all. I suppose I did for a while, but I've never forgotten how to say that. Yeah. So everybody had to choose. And when you choose, it's more your dancer that it is the one in the book, as it were. And I've seen the Morris grow that sort of way into things where people do their own thing. They have a club style of doing things. They have their own dancers as well as the ones, roots dancers that they uh, preserve because they like them as much as so on. And we have this wonderful mixture. And I say, to Crane or I went out one day, two years back, on a day of dance, and I didn't recognise a single dance that was done all day. You know, I thought, I, in my little way, had achieved something well. You know, we are as close to being traditional as we ever can be. Not traditional in the 19th century sense. You can't be like that. We've reinvented the Morris from what it is today. You know, we're coping the fact that all pubs are restaurants. That pubs are not the only places you can dance at. And all this sort of thing. 
when you talk to anybody from the States, Australia or New Zealand, you realise they live in a different culture to us. And there are lessons to be learned from them about how to carry on, what to do, where the future might be, and so on. Um, certainly, uh, too many clubs are still based on the idea one social night a week, and let's go out in the summer and dance at a pub to be sociable. They don't actually go to a community and beat it up, as it were, by dancing all day around the estates and things like that, making it not a nuisance themselves, but making it be known that they're there. And so, in the same way that traditional sides used to do. So, I still think there's, there's a way forward into new territory. And that's really the only message I've got. We're going forward. That's the end of what I'm going to say. Thank you very much. Thank you.